All right. Um, let's start. Welcome to uh, this session about um, uh, Grails, AngularJS, and Spring security. Um, well, I see a lot of faces from the previous talk, so that's a good sign. So I didn't uh, uh, probably entertain you enough. Um, so my name is uh, Alvaro Sanchez. I'm a member of the Grails team at OCI. Uh, I'm based in, in uh, Spain, Madrid. Um, this is my email if you want to uh, send me any question, if you want, and my uh, Twitter account um, if you want to, to say something about this talk. Um, so in this session, well, um, first of all, um, OCI, as you know, is the home of Grails. We do Grails services, so come talk to us. Uh, we have a table over there, um, so we are happy to help you for all your Grails needs. Um, before I begin, uh, there is a, uh, a workshop, uh, which I did in Great Conf EU. Um, that's the URL of the workshop. Uh, it is a self-contained um, um, workshop with uh, instructions to uh, create uh, an application using Grails, uh, REST API, AngularJS, and Spring Security step by step. Uh, so I recommend you to uh, to do the workshop yourselves at home, and because um, it's like uh, you know the long version of this talk. Uh, I will also publish these slides on my SlideShare account, so uh, everything will be online after uh, this session. Um, I got a couple of questions to uh, to you. So, how many of you is using Angular JS at the moment? Raise your hands. So, very few. Okay. Uh, REST APIs. Cool. Spring Security. Uh, Spring Security REST. Good guys. Nice. Um, so, this is about the. Uh, this uh, session. Uh, the first thing I'll explain to you is the, the REST profile. So the REST profile, <coughs> well, the, the profile mechanism is one of the new features of Grails 3. Uh, it was introduced in uh, uh, 3.0, and it was massively improved in 3.1. Um, profiles are a mechanism to uh, create new applications. That's basically it. Uh, there is a specific profile for REST applications. Because if you remember when, uh, when you were using Grails 2, um, when you were creating a Grails application, you will, you will have like uh, everything inside, including GSPs, and many things you don't need in REST API. Because in REST API, you, uh, you want to use the, the controller model, the domain model, services, but not views, right? Uh, so that's what the REST profile gives you. It gives you an application with no GSP, uh, GSPs at all. Um, it has REST-specific uh, plugins and commands. Uh, there's no asset pipeline, no UI plugins. There's nothing like that. Uh, however, there are views in the REST uh, profile, which, is the, which are the, the JSON views, the new ones, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, so the REST profile brings you uh, pro uh, profile-specific commands, like for instance the create domain domain resource. Uh, create domain resource is like create domain class, uh, but the domain class that it creates it contains the add resource annotation. Um, we'll see an example later on. And similarly, we have the RESTful controller to create a, a controller which is a RESTful. We have JSON views. So the idea of the JSON views is that you still have the view part of the MVC. Um, a JSON view, in practice, is a Groovy script um, uh, that is pre-compiled, uh, is um, uh, type-checked, and uh, things like that. Uh, and it 
it is designed to render a JSON representation of whatever you want. So essentially, uh, when you were uh, dealing with GSPs in the past and you were doing things like, for instance, passing a map to the, to the GSP with the model you wanted to, the GSP to render, uh, with the JSON views you do the same. And the JSON view is able to uh, iterate over the, uh, the model and then render a JSON representation of your uh, model. That's the idea. Uh, to get us started to, with the, uh, the REST API profile, uh, this is the create app command. Uh, you specify the, the profile, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you can create a domain resource. And this is how the uh, a domain resource looks like. So this is the, like, the most simple REST API you can create in Rails. Uh, there are more ways to, to achieve this goal, but it, this will be like the, uh, the most easiest one. So the, uh, the add resource annotation is an AST transformation that uh, at compile time will generate a controller for you uh, automatically so you don't have to. And it will also have the required URL mappings for you. So we'll see in a moment how that's um, working actually right now. So I'm going to create uh, an application using the REST API profile. Um, can you see my terminal? Yep. Um, the, uh, for this example, I'm choosing as, as features the uh, Hibernate and JSON views, because that's what I'm going to use. I want the main class, so I want Hibernate, uh, and then uh, JSON views, right? And I call this to do, for instance. Can I give another name just in case? Okay, so this is the, uh, the application. So what I'm going to do is to create a domain resource. <coughs> This is the domain class that gets uh, generated. 
Uh, as I told you, the ad resource annotation um, uh, will generate a controller for you. Uh, the values you see here, like for instance, are read only equals false, uh, and formats are actually default values for for this property. So uh, we can uh, remove them, and what I'm going to specify instead is the URI. Because uh, by default, the, the uh, URL mapping generated will be like a slash to do, which is the, um, the logical name of the, of the domain class. But if we want something else, like this case, then we specify uh, like here. So I'm going to add a couple of properties. And then, Let's add some test data here. And let's run the application. So I have an, uh, an HTTP client here in this terminal. Um, uh, if you're using Mac, uh, it's called HTTP, HTTP uh, It's very cool because it formats the, uh, the JSON uh, in the console, unlike curl. So for instance, if I say, um, uh, this is the, like the uh, root page of the application, uh, this is the JSON representation of the uh, of the uh, root page. So, for instance, if you remember in a classical uh, web uh, Rails web uh, application, you have like a, the typical welcome to Rails uh, web page with all the uh, controller information, the plugins you have installed, uh, the versions, and, and everything. With the REST API profile, the application no longer has that uh, welcome to Rails page, but it has like uh, this JSON representation. Uh, in my case, I have, I should have, the uh, RESTful controller mapped to this URL, which is last to do, and it is the case. Okay, so this is my to dos, and this is a full crude REST API. So I can grab like a single to do element, list them all. Uh, I could create new ones, delete them, uh, things like that. Okay, so very simple, right? Um, so, yeah, we, we've seen how to uh, get started with the uh, REST API. Um, however, uh, I don't think um, you guys have a job where you have to create to-do applications. So, uh, uh, if that's the case, you will likely have like uh, more things to, to do, right? And you'll have to write like, uh, you know, custom actions and uh, you'll have like uh, relationships and, and many things to, to do. Uh, so no worries, because there, if you need more control, uh, then what you can create is RESTful controller. Uh, when you use the create RESTful controller command, this is basically what you get. You get a controller which extends RESTful controller. Uh, the base class gives you for free. You don't have to do anything. Uh, it's all done. Uh, you get like the index method, you get the save, the update, the create, and everything. So uh, all the crude operations we've seen before, you have them for free uh, to get started with. And if you want or if you need to have like a custom actions, for instance, uh, I don't want just to list all the to-dos, but only the ones that are pending, right? This is a custom action. Then you just write your particular action. But for everything else, you have them. And uh, the RESTful controller class is uh, flexible enough. So for instance, you could say, uh, imagine you want a safe method or an update method. That's the read-only property. 
So you can define a read only property, which is what, what we saw in the example before. Uh, and then the save method and the update method won't have any, any action. They won't do nothing. Um, there's many things you can do. So for instance, imagine that to list all the elements is not simply like uh, uh, to do the list. You have to do something else. There is a particular method you can override and Rails will use that method in particular to, uh, to list the resources, right? So uh, it is nicely designed to have uh, hooks where you can uh, participate into the, uh, how do you, for instance, uh, list all the elements? How do you bind the data from a request to the actual domain class? So you can participate in that, right? It's very powerful and very flexible. Uh, and it's a good um, uh, thing to start with. Um, and then we end up with the actual JSON representation. So we've, been the, we've seen the, uh, the model, uh, we've seen the controller, and then the view, which is this thing. So this is an example of a JSON view. Uh, as I told you, we have a model. The model is passed from the controller as you um, have been doing Ingress 2. And then there is a kind of DSL to generate the JSON representation of a, um, of a particular domain. Um, so in the example I have here, Well, this is my, my domain class. Uh, it's got a title, I uh, completed, and it's got an ID as well, um, an implicit ID. However, I didn't define any particular JSON representation for the to-do class. Uh, and we've seen a JSON output, a particular JSON output for this one. Where is that coming from? That is coming from a global template called object, which is doing this thing. So. The, glo the global templates are, are, are per type, uh, and they are allow they, they, they can uh, render any object you want. So, for instance, this is like a, a default mechanism where uh, nothing else is found. So, in my case, because I don't have anything else for for a to do the main class, it will fall into this case. And the render method is the one you uh, you've used before is similar to the render domain class as JSON or things like that. So we'll, we'll take you know the properties and we'll render them uh, as a JSON representation. Um, there are many ways to customize this render uh, method call. So for instance, you could say uh, I want to exclude these properties of the JSON output, or I want to include them uh, the other ones, or I want to expand on this particular association. Uh, so there are many ways you can customize this. And even um, if you want like, you know, a full control over the JSON representation, you can always write your, your own thing. So what I'm going to do is to create a, new uh, JSON view for my to-do. Uh, as per convention, you have like a, a to-do folder and then uh, underscore to do uh, dot json. We can use the add field annotation to specify the model. And then we could say, well, the, um, the most simple example will be do doing like this, render to do. This will give me uh, the same output. But uh, there are many things we can do here, for instance. So I could, for instance, do custom representation. So I could say, like, uh, for instance, the ID is to do dot ID. Uh, description is to do the title.
okay? Uh, so we can do whatever we want with, uh, with this thing. There is also nice support for things like, like HAL. Uh, HAL is a standard JSON uh, specification for uh, defining uh, metadata for your, for, for your uh, JSON response. Like for instance, uh, links to different resources or a pagination, stuff like that. So uh, if instead of doing this, we could do like for instance, HAL uh, render to do. And this will render the, the to do object by the including HAL information. You see here we have links uh, to the self element and then for instance if we have like a relationship with an I don't know, author or user or owner or whatever, um, we could say like the URL of the resource pointing to the user, for instance. Um, So yeah, yes and views. So we've seen everything. We've seen the model, the uh, controller, and the yes and views. Let's introduce the Angular part because uh, we've got the REST API. It's fine, but uh, we would like to have like an, an Angular JS front end to to display that information. Uh, so for that purpose, we have the Angular JS profile. Uh, the Angular JS profile extends the REST profile. So wherever you have in the, uh, in the REST profile, you also have in the Angular profile. So for instance, uh, you have JSON views, you have uh, uh, the create uh, domain resource, the create RESTful controller, you have everything. Because this is designed uh, with the um, idea that you'll have like a REST API and then an Angular JS front end consuming that REST API gives you everything you need to get started with AngularJS, including all the um, uh, dependency management to fetch the JavaScript resources. Like for instance, you need the AngularJS, uh, JavaScript, Angular UI, Angular router. Uh, you need, um, uh, well, a lot of JavaScript dependencies and uh, the, uh, the generated project will take care of that using uh, asset pipeline to to um, uh, build everything together. Uh, it also has code generation for Angular JS, which we'll see in a moment. So you can create uh, an ng controller, ng service, ng domain, and for every command you, you run of this, you will create, you'll have like an MP file uh, as part of a, well, those are like Angular JS concepts, uh, but you know what an Angular JS controller is or a service, so it's basically JavaScript files you get for free. Uh, and another thing you have is scaffolding support as per latest Rails versions, or actually it is a plugin. Um, the way to get started is using the Angular profile instead of the REST API. You can still choose uh, to have the uh, Hibernate 5 or JSON views features. We could choose, like for instance, the MongoDB uh, feature instead of the Hibernate 5. And for instance, to do the scaffolding, what you do is you create your domain class and then you run ng-generate ng all, uh, specifying your, uh, your domain class. So that will create a bunch of files uh, using AngularJS to have a, like a list view, a create view, an edit view, uh, and everything for that particular domain, including all the properties uh, belonging to that domain class. It's nice, uh, we'll see actually right now. Um, so uh, Graham tried to demonstrate this this morning. It failed, so uh, I really hope this works for me. So let's pray to the demo gods. So this is the create app command. Uh, the profile is Angular. Uh, the features are the same, and then the application name.
go to create uh, I'll do the main class again. And then I'm going to pick the um, this thing here. So if I were going to run this, uh, I will have like uh, the, the very same as before. So uh, the REST API with a crew, the interface, um, nothing else. So what I'm going to do is to scaffold um, the domain class. So this is uh, ng generate all, and then it's uh, my app dot to do. Shouldn't take that longer. Okay, so let's see what we got. Um, in the Angular profile, uh, or essentially any Rails application using the Asset Pipeline plugin, uh, you have everything under Rails app assets, JavaScript. Uh, so those guys here, the core module and the index module, are the ones you get by default. Uh, so what we got new is this to-do module. So if we look at the uh, root file, this, is th this file is the entry point of your application. It's the JavaScript file that, that gets loaded uh, in index.gsp, uh, right? Uh, I'm not going to enter into too much details because this is AngularJS code, so, and I'm not an AngularJS expert, but uh, I know the, uh, the minimum. So uh, what you see here is uh, asset pipeline instructions to uh, compose the bundle the JavaScript bundle. So we're requiring the Angular library, of course. We are requiring as well the core module, the index module. Uh, for instance, in the core, you could have like prison services shared across your application. Uh, the index module could have like a controller, services, templates. And um, we have the uh, to do module generated uh, automatically. So we have a list controller, a show controller, and the controller, and so on and so forth. Everything is generated uh, automatically. We also have a, a domain in JavaScript, which is not uh, a real domain. This is just a JavaScript file that using Angular dollar resource uh, REST client is able to communicate with the REST API we've created before. Uh, as you see here, we, we don't specify any particular attribute. 
because what we do is whatever is in the JSON response, they become uh, properties of the JavaScript object when we when we fetch it. Uh, and then the templates are like the you know the HTML parts to render like uh, the create form uh, list and everything. Uh, so let's include that thing. And then, um, I think this is all. So let's run this thing. This is the welcome to Grails thing that we have uh, in the AngularJS application. Um, the difference uh, between a normal Grails application and uh, uh, the Angular profile is that uh, this, this is using the JSON information that we saw for the root endpoint. Like for instance, which controllers are available, uh, available the application status, the, the artifacts, this is fetched with that JSON information. And this is also Angular code. Uh, so I could navigate to the uh, the controller. I don't know if you see on the uh, uh, URL. This is the typical Angular JS uh, hashbang URL. So we're uh, going to the Angular controller, uh, and then, well, this is normal scaffolding. So there's nothing special. So you can create new elements. As I told you, it understands the uh, the types of your domain class. So it understands, for instance, uh, stream properties, uh, boolean properties, uh, associations as well, uh, dates, which are also important to to manage. Uh, well, we can do everything with this scaffolding. Cool thing, right? Um, and uh, the good thing is that the, you have everything in your project to get started with. So if you want to customize that, you, you can do it. Uh, you can also, because, you know, it took me like nothing to, to generate it. So I could, uh, you know, if I make any change, I can, I can throw it away and generate it again. And that gives us to the latest part, which is uh, Spring Security. So. Um, this is a plugin which I brought and uh, named or called Spring Security REST. Uh, Spring Security REST is a compatibility layer over Spring Security Core. Spring Security Core is uh, probably one of the most used plugins in, in Rails, but it has few problems when you're uh, creating a, a REST API. It basically doesn't speak um, a JSON, so. It is only designed to do a form authentication in a server-side view. Uh, it is stateful. It heavily relies on the HTTP session. And uh, that doesn't play really well with the REST API, where you try to be stateless and, and everything like that. So with that in mind, I created a Spring Security REST plugin uh, over, over three years ago. Um, it gives you for free, uh, instead of the login controller and the logout controller, it gives you a login endpoint which speaks JSON. A uh, logout endpoint as well if you're using a stateless implement, a stateful implementation, sorry. Um, it is token-based authentication. It is essentially auth two, uh, if you want. Uh, particularly is the uh, uh, 6750 uh, RFC. Uh, the bare token support. So the idea is that you first authenticate into the um, uh, login endpoint and you get a token. And then, uh, or actually your front end get a token. And then the token is passed to, um, to the backend on every single request in a header, right? And the token contains all the information the backend needs for, to authenticate a user. 
Uh, the implementation by default is stateless. Uh, so it uses a standard or a, well, it's actually standard, yes, called JWT, uh, JSON Web Tokens. Uh, a JSON Web Token is essentially a way to, uh, a secure way to transport arbitrary data, uh, which is in a JSON format. Uh, it is secure because there are mechanisms to, uh, to sign and to encrypt uh, JWT. So when you receive it on the server side, you have the warranty that nobody has uh, modified or tampered the, the token in any way. Uh, and it is possible to include any information inside the JWT. Uh, so that's the stateless implementation. And it's stateless because the user principle, so who you are, who your roles are, are inside the JWT. And that's kept securely in the client. So the server doesn't need to have any HTTP session. Uh, you could potentially give the JWT to uh, a cluster of uh, hundreds of servers, uh, and any of them will be able to, uh, to validate the call, right? Because we don't need any session at all. Um, however, if you want to store the tokens in a stateful way, you can use uh, uh, the plugin supports Mencashd, uh, Redis, Gorm, uh, which uses a table uh, or a domain in the database, and then the Grails cache plugin uh, to store it in memory. Uh, so that's pretty much it. The way to get started is to use the security feature. So the security feature will bring you the minimal setup to get started with the Spring Security REST, which is basically the dependency on build.gradle and also uh, a minimal configuration to configure the filter chains. So the thing is, uh, I told you uh, there is an authentication endpoint. So there is an endpoint that you send a username and password and you get a token, right? And I told you that the client has to send the token to the uh, backend on every single request. The way to do that in AngularJS is using an interceptor. Uh, so uh, the AngularJS supports the concept of, uh, well, it has a list of interceptors that uh, will be executed on every single request. So you don't have to do anything like, you know, for every control I have, I need to read the token from the local storage or something else and then um, pass it. You do it in one place and uh, Angular will uh, automatically execute it on every single request for you, so you don't have to. What we're doing here, uh, essentially is we're, we're adding a new authorization header where the value is better. This is a, a string literal. And then the token which we, uh, we have stored previously in the session storage. We could store this in, in local storage, session storage, cookies, uh, whatever, whatever we want client side because the tokens, I mean, there's, there's no risk storing this locally. The tokens are, are secure. Uh, it is, in theory, impossible to, uh, to modify them in any way. It is like a, a day session ID, if you want. So it's just an arbitrary value. Uh, we'll see an example in a minute. Um, but uh, however, a session ID per se has, is, is uh, meaningless for a server. The server has to actually uh, search for the, you know, in memory representation of the session ID to, to see the content. But the actual string representation of a JWT is self-contained. It contains everything the server needs to know. And in particular, the principle, the spring security principle is there physically. The object is there. So uh, the server is able to um, uh, rebuild the spring security principle based on the information in the uh, JWT. So how this fits everything together?
well, this is the the application running. Uh, we have a, like a login form. I'll show you the Chrome console to see what is actually going on. Uh, so we have a, a user created here, which is a user and pass. So I'll enter that. And I'll clean this thing. So what happened is that uh, a request was made to the uh, login endpoint. So this is the, the endpoint uh, given by the plugin. Uh, it is slash API slash login. Uh, we made a post request with this payload. Very simple, username and password, right? Uh, and this is the response we got. Uh, this is a 6750 uh, compatible uh, was to response. So we got an access token, which is a very long uh, string here. Uh, we got an expiration, a refresh token, uh, the roles, in case you want to have that information for, for instance, uh, uh, showing or hiding uh, elements in the UI based on the, uh, the roles the user have. Uh, this is a fixed value, it's a, it's a bearer token, and bearer means that they are portable. You can potentially give this token to any other application um, and uh, they will be able to authenticate the user. And this is the username. You can customize this to include, for instance, uh, I don't know, user, uh, the full name or email or whatever information you have to display. Um, so what we have to, to take here is the uh, the access token. So this is a JWT token, as I told you. Um, and if we were able to, to decrypt the information, it contains everything the server side needs to, needs to, um, to know about the user. So what the login endpoint is doing is, is actually validating the user and the password. And if that's correct, it encrypts everything into the JWT and gives to the client, okay? Uh, uh, JWTs has an expiration time in seconds, so this is in one hour. Uh, they will expire after one hour, no matter what you do. They don't get refreshed. Uh, and the reason about that is because um, it is impossible to change uh, the content of a JWT. So the, uh, the string we see here is the string representation of a um, of the payload, which is inside the JWT. If we take that payload, uh, change an attribute, for instance, and say, uh, we say uh, spire true or something like that, um, and then we, we generate the string representation of that, we will get a new JWT, right? So it is impossible to, to change them. They will expire. So that's uh, what refresh tokens are for. A uh, refresh token is a way to um, allow the client to obtain new access tokens when they expire. So this information should be taken by the, uh, by the Angular frontend, and they have to say, okay, I know this token will expire in one hour, so I'll uh, set myself a timeout. So for instance, in, in less than one hour, I will use the refresh token to fetch a new uh, access token, okay? That's the way it works. Uh, so we took this, and then if we go to um, to the session storage, right, we see the token stored there in the session storage. We've done that using Angular AES. And then the next thing we did is to make a request to the actual endpoint. So this is the actual endpoint we wanted to, to make a request to, uh, which is slash API slash to do. Uh, we, got, we got a 200 OK uh, because we sent the token in the header, as you see here. So if I, if I were going to, to make a request
we get 401. So if I make a, like a print request with no token, the request is not authorized. You see? Um, and if I, were, if I were going to make a new request passing the token and the token is valid uh, and it didn't expire, then uh, you will uh, get the request authenticated. So yeah, and that's the, so we get the, like the slash to do's, uh, give me the list of to do elements. And then for instance, if I create a new one, we see this is a post request and the token is still there. It's passed on every single request. Okay, that's the way it works. Um, so, a few things here. Uh, let's see the AngularJS part for a while. I think I'm running out of time. Well, this is the old interceptor you saw before. Uh, and then there is a login function that is called in the login form we, we saw before. Uh, so we're making a post request to, to slash API slash login. And then what we do is essentially store the token in the session storage. That's all. Uh, there are probably uh, cleaner ways to do this in AngularJS, but this is probably enough for the uh, scope of this presentation. So this is all I wanted to tell you about. Uh, thank you very much for um, attending to this session. I hope you like it, and uh, we'll have time for questions. Uh, so the um, the actual place where you have the users uh, will depend on Spring Security. So, for instance, uh, if you if you have a, a Spring Security core with the default domain classes, that will be uh, in uh, in a couple of tables in the database, right? But if you have a Spring Security LDAP plugin. Uh, you, you, your users will be authenticated using the sp uh, Spring Security LDAP. So uh, the slash API slash login endpoint doesn't care about where the users are stored. It will depend on your Spring Security configuration. So there, there is a Spring Security LDAP plugin for Grails? There is. And it's actually available for, for Grails 3. But uh, in theory, you could. Uh, grab like you know the core library and then configure your authentication providers yourself so uh, it is uh, to say it is an authentication provider agnostic so it doesn't care where your your users are it depends on your configuration and you could potentially have like a multiple authentication providers i mean all this spring security stuff you can use it any other question No, okay, uh, I got a QR code pointing to a simple uh, form with a couple of questions about this talk. So I appreciate it if you can fill that because it's gonna be useful for me. Otherwise, thank you very much again for, for being here and uh, talk to you later.